So let's dive into the, the module one B uh, in, in more specific details. And um, the topics um, that we are looking to cover, there's a lot of um, knowledge also in this module. Uh, so let's 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 see if we can get this done in a, in a, in about two and a half hours time. So first of all, we'll start with this uh, one key mega trend of why um, why a startup has kind of continued to become the vehicles of innovation. There are many many factors there, but one of the key things to understand in the context of ecosystems means that innovation used to be because because of the resources it required to produce a new product or a new service or concept. Um, it was traditionally between bigger companies and also between universities and research institutions that were able to have such resources needed to, to be able to develop uh, um, materials for innovation as well as taking those innovations to the markets. So that also means because there was big investments involved that, uh, that, um, that these tend to happen in a very protected environment and closed structures. So what has been happening over the years is that uh, the weight of innovation have been moving from purely innovation ecosystems more to, op to more open and more collaborative um, open innovation that, uh, that where the driver of those innovations are really the startups. And it doesn't mean that the innovation have moved away from tradi traditional means there's a, just a certain weight shift that has happened as well as, as, uh, as that certain type of innovation, like more disruptive and more out of the box type of uh, innovation tend to happen outside of the, the, the closed structures. And whereas more of the iterative incremental uh, innovation continue to happen um, more on the traditional, more closed settings as well as, for example, innovating for, for much complex things like uh, medicine or uh, new energy solutions or some of those types of things that are still very investment heavy and have very uh, strict processes and protocols uh, for security and regulation reasons. Uh, so the, this is just to, to, to get more of the perspective between these these kind of ecosystems and the transition that is happening. So the old world used to be much slower, it used to be simpler, much more linear. There wasn't these social networks and uh, other digital communication tools and cheap technologies and platforms that have flat, flattened the world and created uh, uh, totally different dimensions for us to work with. It used to be about ideas, invention, and research by big companies. And uh, most of those are already working at their best uh, and are very difficult to improve with outside effort. So all of the development that happened in this closed structure can really happen only by the organizations themselves. Whereas in the, in the more open innovation environment and specifically with startup innovation, it's much easier to identify the new innovations, invest into them, and, um, and, and basically develop the, um, the ingredients and surroundings and policies and regulations and things for them. So the new world is, is not linear anymore. It's very global, it's very networked, it's very digital. There's a lot of this cheap technology, free technology, platforms, uh, uh, resources that can be used uh, based only on, on um, subscription model, no need to invest, no need to buy, no need to own, um, and, and models where you can get a hundred thousand worth of uh, server credit from Amazon to build a platform and your business. Um, so it's, it's amazing resources that are made available these days. This is also means that the innovation is 
more open, is more uh, faster validating whether markets are accepting it, and uh, and the whole um, whole environment is is much more free from anyone from anywhere with internet connection um, is is basically having access to both knowledge and free tools, free software to start building the initial versions of their innovations to be validated in the market. At the same time, the bigger organizations are starting to see that uh, it really uh, this open innovation is more like an outsourced innovation. So in sort, instead of thinking outsourcing their production, they can also outsource their innovation where they only need to focus on the, the kind of their core existing business that is already generating the revenues and, and owning and driving that and iteratively improving. But when it comes to investing into more disruptive innovation, um, basically uh, they are learning that it's more cost effective uh, for them to uh, consider it more through an investment or acquisition or partnership or platform strategies uh, to enable faster innovation cycle to provide to their customers and channels. Now, of course, the, 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 the most biggest examples in this type of behavior is Apple with their App Store and iTunes Store. Uh, they don't have to figure out what is the, the trendiest music. They don't have to figure out what is the most necessary application. Uh, they just enable the platform and take 30% uh, cut from all the sales and if you think about that that's more than majority of taxes in any countries in the world for any business so it just tells uh, to what level that can go another example is of course amazon with their uh, infrastructure offering but also their e-commerce offering providing to tools and platforms and channels for small uh, uh, retailers to provide their new products in Amazon. They even provide loans for them to be able to produce their products and all kinds of different things. So it's not only about the innovation, it's also uh, creating enabling factors for innovation. And this continues to increase the pace and the cycle of innovation. And, and uh, the closed structure simply cannot um, handle this pace and that's why they tend to focus more on iterative innovation and also for um, for the, those types of industries and innovations that take much more longer time like a medical treatment or a medicine or things like that so uh, continuing from this research by Kaufman Foundation about startups. So these were very strong findings that uh, over the 20, the last 25 years, almost all of the private sector jobs were created by businesses that were less than five years old. So this is not only the innovative startups, this is also in general the new companies. And this research is uh, based in based to US, uh, but Kaufman has a very broad coverage, so this is not focused on any specific state as such. But this is also very key data, and there's other research and data that supports this, that, that actually between this same time, companies more than five years old destroyed more jobs than they created in, only, in all but only few of those years. Uh, and at the same time, the, the lifespan of a publicly traded company, uh, their lifespan has been uh, systematically decreasing. So it means that the companies have shorter, even the big companies have shorter uh, lifespan. So they, once they reach their peak, they also die much faster than they used to in the past. So this data is also um, uh, available. So why is it so kind of, uh, why startup is so misunderstood and why does it is kind of so unclear term? Um, 
while we covered a lot of this in the in the module one, uh, we provide here another another perspective is that is that because the world traditionally have been moving so much slow and there has been less of those uh, faster growth stories. The tra traditional business categorizing only sees companies as what they are at any given state. And there's very little actually uh, ability to categorize or, or um, list the companies that are actually on the, their uh, growth path. So while there's this kind of, you can divide them, how the companies are at any given state, you can make the categories bigger or smaller. But really the, the problem here is that these are based on stable, stale situation where things change only very slowly. But the world is increasingly accelerating and the economy is, is accelerating and, and the changes within the economy are accelerating as well as the, the cycles um, and the digital layer on top of all of this is then also shifting the bait uh, between different geographics uh, can change very quickly. So because startup is a process of innovation and growth by design, it doesn't fit to those categories or at any different given time uh, they belong to different categories, either from how they actually are, so what size they are, what size their revenue is, or the perception that they want to give from them. So sometimes startups also, they want to refer themselves as a real company if they try to convince a customer, or sometimes they want to refer themselves as a, as a small business or or SME if they are applying for grant or funding that is suitable for that. Sometimes they like to refer themselves as a, as a gazelle company, uh, depending on who they're communicating to. So that's why it's also that they are quite hard to put in the box. Um, and there isn't really a, a universal useful uh, terminology that has reached uh, a significant scale to help uh, capture this phenomenon. And that's one part where we want to focus and we invite everyone else to help focus on bringing this kind of uh, communication uh, for everyone's reads so that it makes it easier to identify both the startups and also the, the things um, related to startups, being that support services, being that funding instruments, being that and individual resources on and so forth. So startups are really about the innovative innovativeness and delivering innovations to the to, to new markets and uh, with the focus of growth. So here's really a perspective to kind of have some additional dimension to to categorize um, different types of companies. So any new company is not to be considered as a startup. Also a small company should not be considered as a startup. At the same time, uh, the word scale up um, is, is often used to describe a startup in a later phase, but it should not be considered that it's only limited uh, for, for a new startup to become a scale up because actually majority of them also fail. But in addition, also a small business through structural change, through ownership change, uh, actually can become a scale up. Some of these examples would be, of course, uh, let's take a, a subway chain. The, the subway chain, which is, it's a, it was a small mom and pop store, uh, and then someone created it uh, into a franchise business. Or there's a movie even on the McDonald's chain with the founder and the whole story, uh, how a small business can actually become a scale-up business. But scale-up, so it means that scale-up also is not necessarily um, innovative as such, but it's still a scale-up, where a startup usually is based on uh, unvalidated business model, uh, trying to validate it in real markets, therefore validating that they are making an innovation uh, to deliver new value. 
So if we look at just the difference between an innovation process and a startup, so the innovation itself is about providing new value, generating product, service or business model to a validated market. And the validated market basically means to, uh, to identify customers uh, at a certain size or reach and how that is delivered to them. But at the same time, innovation doesn't necessarily have an owner. And it's logical that innovation considered to be created by a, um, uh, a big company is just the next product of that company. But innovation can live from research lab to, to um, openly published um, a concept that then can be developed by multiple parties, startups, multiple new companies, multiple bigger companies, trying to um, validate that innovation in different shape or form in markets. So innovation itself can also live without any kind of ownership and therefore it also unfortunately often means that potential innovation, so a lot of the research findings and, uh, and also uh, even some, uh, a lot of the ideas and concepts actually get lost because no one is keeping track of them and they really don't have an owner. Um, uh, so even a lot of these technology transfer concepts that universities are having are failing to, to, to adapt themselves to the new world where the innovation is no longer so intensively seek from them in a form of licensing their research findings. And therefore, the majority of those never get to the market. But in case of startups, uh, they actually take on the innovation that they oftentimes self-create. So it comes from the founder's own ideas or backgrounds, or perhaps it starts from a research finding in the university if they have a good um, release process for their IPs. Um, so they create the innovation in real business. But at the same time, and this is often the really missed part, that they also have to create a new organization and a growing organization. And while that is a positive thing, that there is true ownership behind that innovation in an investable format, uh, at the same time, the support function often support functions broadly uh, misses this uh, challenge that uh, the, the startups are having, how to establish a founding team, how to, how to uh, make commitment for, with that team, and how to uh, build a team from five people to 100 people to 1,000 people. How does that process happen? How is it supported? Uh, how it can be made uh, easier? So, from the, with the lens of the development phases, it really means that there is this more vis externally visible part building the service and product into a business. But then the other part is building the, the team into a, a organization. So this part usually gets much less attention, much less uh, knowledge and information is available. Um, because just to understand the innovation process from nothing to value generate, generating product or service is already a, a complexity on its own. But in addition, there actually isn't that much expertise available. How do you develop an organization from nothing? Uh, these are types of things that are not really teached anywhere um, in a systematic manner. There are, you know, bits and pieces and places, and there's a lot of knowledge out there, but it's not available in a constructive and consumable way, let alone delivered in systematic way in volumes uh, in the education institutes, for example. So what does this mean? Um, it basically means that um, while in all the investors all the financiers, everyone knows that the team is the key, but at the same time, um, the support to build a team is, is uh, really missing. A great team 
can make even an average idea or concept fly, where an average team can fail even a great idea. So it, it's really the essence of, of uh, all the beginning for, for the innovation potential to even exist. It's the execution and the structure of the team and their capabilities and their collaboration effort uh, abilities. Um, and, and even simple things as the agreements that they create among themselves, how they divide their equity and so forth. 